Well, uh, greetings, everyone. I want to I wanna say good afternoon, but I know the time in uh, other countries may be morning. So I would like to welcome you all to the fourth international multidisciplinary breast conference. Last year, around this time, uh, we were, I believe, the last uh, meeting that took place in Dubai live before the pandemic started. Um, and this year, we decided to have an abbreviated virtual meeting discussing the most important pertinent topics for our daily practice. Uh, today, we have two important sessions. The first one on metastatic breast cancer management, and the second one about selected hot topics in breast cancer management. Tomorrow, we will have a very unique event, uh, probably uh, its first in the region, to have a virtual uh, oncoplastic video workshop uh, given by uh, experts in the field. I would like 10 minutes to discuss uh, about the cancer and COVID-19 research from UAE uh, because of its important implications on all of our patients. Dr. Hamid Ashamsi, he is uh, the president of the Emirates Oncology Society, and he is a medical oncology consultant and the director of the Cancer uh, Institute at Burjil Cancer Institute uh, Center, which is the new center at Burjil Medical City. Uh, he is really, uh, without any doubt, the most prominent uh, medical leader uh, in UAE nowadays. So without uh, further ado, I would like to give the talk to him for 10 minutes before we proceed with session one. Go ahead, Hamid. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I wish you congratulations, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for uh, this uh, event, uh, despite the current pandemic. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, I do have uh, 10 minutes to present, so I'm gonna get into it. So I'm gonna present to you our uh, cancer research uh, from the UAE during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this is my disclosure. Uh, before I start, I would like you to look into this uh, uh, photo and just keep in mind what does it mean. Uh, we'll discuss it later on. Just look into it. And, and again, I will explain to you why this is very important photo. Um, over the last 40 years, there has been significant increase in the cancer research in the UAE. And as you can see from the figure here, which we are uh, working on right now uh, to publish cancer research over 40 years in the UAE, there is significant increase in the, in the number of publications over this period. But certainly, we need to work more on the quality of this research. Looking at the, at the spending of research in the UAE, uh, it's still primitive uh, compared with other uh, countries. Again, the amount of spending now here looking at different countries is still very primitive and need to improve that. So what about the research from UAE during the COVID-19? Uh, we published 18 publications in 2020, three of them in the oncologist, two in JAMA, one in Lancet, and one in BMC and eCancer. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I was looking into resources to improve my skills and knowledge uh, how to deal with this COVID-19 pandemic when it comes to cancer care. There was only one publication back in 2016 looking at the influenza pandemic planning, and it was a very small paper addressing uh, how should we uh, plan for a future pandemic. So for that, we decided to collaborate with the eminent uh, researchers from different parts of the world, including from, from Saudi Arabia, Wuhan, China, uh, UK, uh, US, uh, Canada, and also uh, uh, Italy. And we published the first uh, uh, international uh, recommendation, I would call it, regarding the pandemic and the COVID-19 for cancer patients. This was highlighted in the ASCO post uh, back in May 2020. And this, was, this has been cited more than 300 times and one of the most cited papers in UAE oncology research history. And this was also cited up to date. The, the paper also was selected as one of the, uh, the top publications in the oncologist and was also named one of the most cited articles from Indy Anderson since we, do, since we had some, public, uh, some, some uh, collaborators from Indy Anderson. Um, our, our second paper was in, in, in JAMA Oncology, and we asked a very simple question. Should we screen every single patient coming for, for chemotherapy for COVID-19? And the answer at that time was nobody knows the answer. So we decided to screen our patients, and we screened more than 89 patients. And uh, we found that around 8% of these patients that are asymptomatic 
and they have COVID-19. Thus, it's, it's very important to postpone their treatment until they become negative or at least they are asymptomatic uh, without any significant uh, comorbidities. Uh, this was one of the most uh, uh, viewed uh, publication in JAMA Oncology at that time, and was one of the trending articles also from JAMA Oncology. We want to ask another, another question, which was, should we screen these patients every single time they come for chemotherapy? Because the previous paper was only screen this patient first time only. So we went and we screened, we did the serial screening for patients with COVID-19 before their first cycle, second cycle, third, third cycle, and we found that around 5 to 6% of these patients, they remain positive throughout their cycles. And again, the, the outline of this paper, which I didn't have much time to go through, you can see here around the first cycle, 6% positive, 5%, 4 or 5% at the third cycle, fourth cycle, 9.4%. But again, because the number of these patients were increasing as we go to the, the, the screening method. This again was highlighted in the ASCO uh, post uh, back in November 2020. Uh, we did collaborate with our colleagues in Cleveland Clinic for answering the similar questions where they screened their patient uh, before chemotherapy. They had 133 patients and they found the similar numbers of around 7% of these patients asymptomatic and they have COVID-19, which, which required the chemotherapy to, to be postponed. Uh, there were no guidelines regarding uh, uh, the treatment, sorry, the screening for these patients. So we, we published a preprint regarding our recommendation at the Emerson College Society, how to screen for this patient. Again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but we, we publish what we think is, 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 is reasonable within also the, the, the resources available for each different uh, center or country. This is just a summary of the recommendation that we had, and you can go back to it, and you can Google it, and you can find this publication. Uh, our next publication was actually across the Arab countries where we asked questions that, what are the national approaches for, for responses for COVID-19 pandemic during this pandemic? And uh, this was published in the eCancer with the eminent uh, uh, researcher from the across the Arab country, countries. And the bottom line was there was good responses, but, but these responses were inconsistent across the countries. So more collaborations and, and, and evidence-based uh, approach to these recommendations should be implemented. Uh, we also published another paper regarding a very unique population where patients, where our patients, they travel a lot outside the country for uh, cancer care. And during the, the pandemic, uh, these treatments were suspended and many of these patients, they came suddenly back to the countries, uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, without any pathology, without imaging, without in the, in the middle of the radiation. So we outlined with our colleagues here how to handle or how to approach these patients in a systematic way. We also published another publication during the, 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 the middle phase, I would call it, of the pandemic. It's called the evolution of the cancer care in response to the COVID-19. Certainly at the beginning, we were, we were recommending to delay the treatment, to postpone some treatment, but I think this has changed and we also reflected this in our publication trying to address these challenges and trying to uh, 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 put these patients back on track regarding treatment screening as well. Um, we had another publication with our colleague from King Abdullah Medical City highlighting the importance of the telemedicine and cancer care during the COVID-19. And this was a survey of more than 200 uh, patients, 200 uh, practicing physicians. And this showed that, you know, a good implementation of the telemedicine, but there is a need for a better infrastructure for this telemedicine. Also, uh, back in November, we published about rethinking cancer screening and diagnosis during the COVID-19 pandemic, again, highlighting the importance of not forgetting about screening as this pandemic most likely will continue for a few more months or maybe a year. So we shouldn't forget about you know, uh, screening of the patient of cancer as we anticipate increasing of the number of cases, which we are seeing right now, too. we're seeing more patients with little bit of advanced cancer than anticipated due to the fear of the COVID-19 pandemic. Another paper with our colleague from King Abdullah University, again, addressing the tele-oncology uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were very pleased to publish the first um, uh, publication regarding the COVID-19 vaccination for cancer patients, what oncologists and the cancer patient need to know. Uh, we recommended uh, at that time, which was actually back early in December before ASCO and ESMO publishing anything about this, we recommended case by case basis. We didn't say it's contraindicated, but we are not, you know, we were not in a position to say that they should be vaccinated because again, this is just a personal opinion uh, and, and we needed more support from big entities like ASCO and ISMU to say it clear that you know these patients should be vaccinated. And I think it's very clear now for all of us that you know patients with cancer should be vaccinated without any delay. 
This is our citations for the last uh, year. And again, there's a inc significant increase in citation, and this is for UAE citations. Uh, this is actually uh, going back to the same photo I, I showed you initially. If you notice, most of our publications are with collaboration. Collaboration is the key if you want to be successful in, in, in research. You have to collaborate with your colleagues from within the country, from outside the country. This is the key success way of getting the, 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 the research moving forward. If you look at the cancer research in UAE, only 16% of the research over the last 40 years were with international collaboration, which is a very, very small number. And that's why we need to, to push further for more collaboration with our colleague, colleague around the world. Collaboration is the key, and sky's the limit. But I think this is not uh, this is not uh, uh, anymore. As our our leaders and our country, they reach the, the the they reach Mars in their in their mission, and we continue to work with everybody. We're happy to collaborate with everyone when it comes to the cancer research. And please, if you if you would like to join our Emerson College Society group, you can direct your phone to this uh, QR code. You'll be joining the group. No, no, uh, uh, nothing except announcement about, you know, activities related to oncology cancer. Thank you so much. And sorry, this was a rush, but I was only given for 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I really want to congratulate uh, Dr. Mohammed al-Bashir for his great effort for uh, making this uh, fourth uh, international breast cancer meeting uh, uh, happening. And a great thank for Dr. Mahmoud Tamer and uh, the Breast uh, American Society of Breast uh, Surgeon uh, for their great support. And uh, thank you also for Dr. Ahmed uh, for uh, supporting uh, from the Emirate uh, Oncology Society. We have uh, today a very esteemed uh, speakers uh, uh, across the world. Also, we know that uh, this is the first meeting happening in, in UAE with a very good, well-balanced uh, uh, speakers from medical oncologists, surgeons, uh, pathologists, radiologists, as in the tumor board, uh, dedicated for the management uh, of breast cancer. So we will have uh, five presentations, and uh, after each presentation, we'll have five minutes uh, uh, to take the questions for that speaker. So I encourage everyone to put uh, their question in the question and answer so we can directly direct this question to the speaker. So uh, I'm really delighted uh, to present uh, our uh, first speaker, Dr. Asima Khan, uh, who's uh, interim co-vice uh, uh, chair research in the Department of Surgery in Broome uh, Family Professor Cancer of Research. And she's uh, really uh, very interested in, 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 in surgeries. Uh, mainly breast uh, surgeries, families uh, in uh, breast and male uh, breast cancer, young women, and different type of surgery, lumpectomy, uh, mastectomy, nipple sparing, and even for uh, benign breast cancer. So her title is uh, for today, Surgical Management of Patients with Oligometastasis. Uh, please welcome uh, 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 Dr. Asima, although we like to see you probably in person in future in, in, in United Arab Emirates. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen and hear me. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here, even though it is remote. I hope, like you, that it will be face to face in the future. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Al Bashir and Dr. Al Tamer and all of the organizers for including me in this very interesting meeting. And I was asked to talk about the role of surgery in oligometastatic breast cancer. So um, I think that you will be hearing actually the more exciting data about management of um, oligometastatic disease uh, in terms of the radiotherapy of it. Um, I was asked to address surgery, but I thought it would be useful uh, to start out by um, defining what we mean by oligometastasis. So here you see example of oligometastasis on the left and polymetastasis on the right. And uh, clearly the difference is that in one case there is very limited disease and in the other there are many lesions often too numerous to count. So this term was first introduced by Dr. Hellman and Wieselbaum in 1995 and they thought that that uh, as this was a separate category of metastatic breast cancer, uh, an intermediate state between local disease and widespread metastatic cancer. And uh, they proposed that cure would still be possible if all detectable metastatic lesions received radical local therapy. And indeed, early reports did describe 
patients with limited metastatic cancer who achieve long-term complete remission, remission with local therapy alone. Today, we would not accept that, of course, because uh, we all recognize that systemic therapy is the mainstay uh, of breast cancer treatment, not only in stage four patients, but also in earlier disease. It's very important. So now we talk about multidisciplinary, multimodality care, uh, but the question is how much local therapy should be a part of this uh, when the disease is in stage four. So definitions of oligometastases have of course varied. Uh, most definitions are based on the number of metastatic lesions or sites with a threshold of three to five lesions, uh, either in a single site or across uh, different organ sites. I favor the single site definition. Uh, this can be either synchronous at the time of breast cancer diagnosis or metachronous at a later date after the initial disease has been treated. Uh, organ sites involved may vary, of course, and the biologic profile of the tumor is extremely important, particularly in this day and age of uh, targeted therapy. Um, prognostic factors. So there have been a lot of systemic, systematic reviews of this topic in the last few years. Um, and I selected one to talk about in detail, which was actually one of the better reviews, I think, and was published just last year uh, from a group at the Netherlands Cancer Institute. And they reviewed all of the data. It's all retro retrospective data, particularly with regard to surgery, but in, for, gen for oligometastases in general, um, there's the only prospective data I would say is actually in the radiotherapy field. And you'll be hearing more about that from Dr. Youssef later on. Uh, but, um, but they included papers that specified the maximum number of metastatic sites or lesions. Uh, all metastatic lesions had to um, be amenable to ablative therapy, um, and single metastatic organ site was allowed if the number of metastatic lesions was provided. Uh, and this is sort of a grid of their results. They used the strict criteria for defining quality uh, of the publication and defining the likelihood of, of bias. And the grayness of each square for these 20 studies reflects uh, you know, poorer quality and higher bias. And you can see that the majority, the great majority suffer from at least some bias and um, are of moderate quality or not good quality, poor quality. Uh, and so this sort of summarizes the state of the field and, and gives us some direction of how much we need to learn about uh, this condition in order to make uh, rational treatment plans. So uh, they also, the same group also looked at um, five-year survival uh, for oligometastatic disease, uh, which is shown here. And I would point out again that these patients were not necessarily treated with local therapy to the metastatic site. So this is just overall survival. And they grouped it by the organ system. So the blue dots above are organs not, organ system not defined. In the middle is the green liver, uh, then the yellow lung, and then there's a study of bone only, and then the magenta dot at the bottom is a local uh, recurrence and sternal involvement. Uh, so overall, the five-year survival is in the 50 to 75 range, 75% uh, range, which is much better than what we would expect with stage four disease. So this supports the initial hypothesis of Dr. Hellman and colleagues that uh, this is a state which has a favorable prognosis, uh, but there's still much that remains to be understood. They looked at prognostic factors in these 20 studies that they thought worth including, um, and the prognostic factors reflect what we uh, sort of have understood so far, which is that um, the number of metastatic lesions is important. The disease-free interval is very important, I think, between the primary tumor and the metastasis formation. Although synchronous oligometastatic disease does seem to have a better prognosis, uh, but short interval from primary treatment to, met uh, to metachronous metastasis uh, is not a good thing. Uh, hormone receptor status is important, of course, for treatment planning and for defining biology, as is HER2 status. And in their study, they also found that the pathologic nodal status of the original tumor was prognostic as well. 
So in terms of surgical resection, and again, the, the, the studies that I just summarized did not include a consideration of surgical resection. It, for surgical resection and survival value, I would say that this is really a data-free zone. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do still. And I'm sure the UAE and, and, um, and uh, your neighborhood can contribute to this data. So this is something for you to consider studying, I suppose. Uh, but some uh, retrospective data we have to acknowledge in small subsets of highly selected patients does suggest an association between the use of surgical ablation and improved survival. And in my view, this is selection bias until proven otherwise. So I'll show you a couple of examples of studies that have looked at surgical ablation of, of oligometastases. This is a very large series from, from the um, Oncology Institute in Milan. Uh, this is not just breast cancer patients, uh, but two thirds of the patients had epithelial primaries. There were almost 600 uh, people studied. Um, and they found that uh, at their institute, an R0 or complete resection with free margins was achievable in 85%. The mean disease-free interval was 46 months. Uh, the R0 re resection was a strong predictor of better survival. Um, and with an R0 resection, five-year survival was 46%. So this is lung lesions. And then here's a series of studies for hepatic resection of liver metastases uh, with the breast primary. And I've selected only the larger ones to include in this table. Um, so, and the larger ones go from anywhere from 50 upwards to about 100. Uh, the median survival seems to be initiated at about, you know, the, the lower limits are in the 30, 32 month range. And the higher is in, you know, approaching five years. Uh, so uh, better survival than what we would expect with liver metastases. But again, these are small studies, retrospective, highly selected patients. What they did find, the common theme in these studies is that the factors associated with poor survival are a short disease-free interval, hormone receptor negativity, uh, poor response to chemotherapy, and positive resection margins. So if we consider surgical resection of oligometastatic disease, these are the things that we should look at in terms of advising our patients. All that being said, it is a reality that surgical resection of uh, metastatic lesions has shown an increasing trend over the last few years. So these are data from the first decade of the century. Uh, and particularly at high volume centers, you can see uh, that there is a distinct, significant, high, uh, statistically significant trend towards an increase. Um, I would point out that the inpatient mortality uh, for these ablative procedures was 2%. So this does not include complications that then occurred after discharge and uh, patients returned and, and had um, you know, poor, poor course because of that. So, uh, so surgery always carries some risk and, and that's another important thing to, to remember and to remind our patients about. So the role of uh, local therapy for metastatic sites, it is there, it's a, it's a possibility. Is it justified is the question. And this is a very nice review by Dr. Palmer, David Palmer, who has actually done a lot of work in this area, published a few years ago. And he points out that the rapid adoption of local therapy approaches has occurred in the absence of strong supporting clinical data. Uh, there are fundamental questions that we still need to answer. Um, and uh, in particular, the biology and the biomarkers that underpin an oligometastatic state um, are largely not understood at the moment. So the current consensus, I think, about those most likely to benefit from ablative therapy, surgical ablation, but also this applies to radiotherapy. Um, uh, but uh, these include a long disease-free interval, uh, breast primary sites. So in comparison to other primary sites, uh, breast cancer has, in general, the most favorable outcomes with these local ablative, ablative approaches. Uh, a small number of metastatic lesions. Uh, the size of the met metastatic lesions should also be small. Uh, and it, that if one offers this to a patient, it should be with the expectation that complete ablation can be achieved. And for surgery, that means resection with free margins. For radiotherapy, that means that a, an effective biologic dose can be delivered. 
Um, and uh, then other means of complete ablation are also being considered, but the data for those as well remains immature. So I wanted to turn for a few minutes to local therapy for the primary site and stage four disease, uh, because I think we can learn some very useful lessons from the experience in that arena. Um, as, as you are all aware, there were many retrospective studies published regarding the value of surgery for the intact primary uh, in women with stage four breast cancer. Uh, so these are uh, de novo stage four patients. And in general, uh, this is one of one meta-analysis, other similar analyses have been published, uh, some very recently actually. Um, the resection of the intact primary uh, seemed to be associated with longer survival with an overall hazard ratio of about 0.7. Early in the experience though, it was clear that these studies were biased, that women receiving surgery were younger, had smaller tumors, had more, had more, uh, were more frequently hormone receptor positive and the metastatic burden was lower. So uh, it became very clear that although there appeared to be a consistent benefit uh, in this association, uh, there was, it was also equally possible that there was a consistent bias. And as a result of that, there were six randomized trials launched with two basic designs. Uh, in the first design, which to my mind is more logical, um, uh, de novo stage four patients um, underwent primary systemic therapy since that is the mainstay of treatment for this condition. Uh, if they had no progression, they had a second registration with randomization to either continued systemic therapy or local regional uh, or um, local regional therapy to the primary sites. And um, the second design uh, was um, upfront randomization with um, resection, one arm receiving resection and radiotherapy for the primary site, and then continued systemic therapy. So there were three trials with the first design. The Indian study has been published. I'm sure you're all aware of the results. Uh, the US and Canada study was presented at ASCO last year. The Japan study is, has completed accrual and we hope for analysis and results next year. Um, the second design upfront randomization, uh, the Turkish study has been published and we will look at those results. And the Austria study was halted early because of low accrual, but they have published results on 90 patients. The Netherlands study really never took off. They had essentially no accrual and they closed it quite early. So these are the results from the Indian study, Tata Memorial, um, the author was Budve, uh, published in 2017. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference in survival between the two arms. They did use induction systemic therapy. For the Turkish study, there was, uh, their primary endpoint was the three-year survival, which was not significantly different, but at five years, they did report an improved survival for the local regional arm um, with a hazard ratio of about 0.6, I think it was, uh, and they did not use induction systemic therapy. So these results, we can, we don't really have time to go into the details of the differences as to why the outcomes are so different. But um, just to remember uh, these in viewing the results of the ecog Akron trial, uh, which was uh, where women with de novo disease uh, stage four disease received optimal systemic therapy based on patient and disease features. If they did not progress, they were randomized and then followed for two years. Uh, the early local therapy com consisted of complete tumor resection with free surgical margins with postoperative radiotherapy being added according to standards of care. Uh, the design was amended in 2013, two years after the study opened because of low accrual, and we ended up with a design of 368 women enrolled with a 19%, with the power to detect 19% difference in the two arms at three years. The primary endpoint was overall survival. The secondary endpoint was time to local regional progression and health-related quality of life. Uh, we did enroll 390 patients, 131 ended up in the systemic therapy arm and 125 in the early local therapy arm. There was crossover allowed and the crossover rate that we observed was, was within what we planned for. 
Um, the overall survival curves were completely overlapping, absolutely, absolutely no difference between arms. The median survival of note was 54 months. Um, and so these women really are doing better regardless of whether they receive early local treatment. Uh, so that, of course, is very encouraging. These are the results by subset. Um, and uh, among women who had tumors with therapeutic targets, HER2 and hormone receptors, the survival curves again overlapped with absolutely no difference. Um, local regional progression uh, was less frequent in, this, in the uh, local therapy arm, 10% versus 25% in the systemic therapy arm. We would have expected this to translate into a quality of life advantage, but unfortunately it did not. Here are the quality of life results. The only difference between the two arms was at 18 months, which was actually our primary quality of life endpoint. And un unfortunately for us, for those of us who were in invested in this hypothesis, um, the difference actually favored the arm uh, with continued systemic therapy. So lo early local therapy did not provide a quality of life advantage, which is I think a really important finding. Uh, our quality of life results parallel those seen in the Austrian study. So these are reported by Fitzel and colleagues. Again, no difference in quality of life. So uh, what are the exceptions? And one exception uh, where one could potentially think about local regional treatment for the primary site is this state of stage four disease, but uh, no, but with no evaluable disease after systemic therapy. And this is one example of a recently published study from Japan. There are some others like it, mainly from MD Anderson, much older studies. But you can see that here they accumulated 75 patients over 30 years. So the data are really hard to interpret. But whether the patients received this CR slash NED state with local treatment or without local treatment, they did better than those who did not get to an NED state. So this does not tell us anything about the value of local treatment. It may tell us something about the NED state, but again, these are highly selective patients. Uh, so this other um, condition I'll skip over because you'll be hearing about it from Dr. Zedan, but, uh, but patients who achieve the NED state with complete ab ablation with radiotherapy may fall into the same category. Uh, so in conclusion, I would say that early local therapy um, does not improve survival uh, and it not, should not be offered um, to patients with the expectation of survival, of a survival benefit. Um, and although local disease progression is more likely without LRT, the use of LRT for the primary site does not improve quality of life. Um, I think one exception is when systemic disease is well controlled, but, but the primary site is progressing, the so-called oligoprogressive disease, then I think local regional therapy can be considered, but with a clear explanation of the perceived advantages. Uh, and a reminder again, that the Japanese trial results are pending and we're looking forward to them with great trepidation and potentially hope too. So uh, in oligometastatic disease, the implications for patient care today are that ablation outside of a clinical trial can be considered if lesions are few and small, disease-free interval is long, complete ablation appears feasible, and very importantly, toxicity is low. And of course, appropriate systemic therapy options should be used in combination and ongoing trials need to be completed. And there is one that is sort of on hold but may resume in the US. Uh, and I thank you very much for your uh, attention and for the invitation. And I can take a few questions because unfortunately I'll need to leave pretty soon. 
Thank you very much for your kind uh, presentation and uh, uh, excellent overview about the resection of oligometastasis and covering the, the, the primary uh, disease in de novo metastasis. Um, we learn a lot from these randomized trials. Although we, can, we were a standard of care and most of these cases uh, uh, presented in tumor board, we go for the primary resection if there is a limited disease and we change our practice according to these uh, uh, phase three randomized clinical trials. Do you expect that we can have a phase three trial on oligometastasis? So if one uh, in, uh, uh, for oligometastasis and local ablation, so I think the hope there you will hear about later this afternoon. I, you know, if one compares what is possible and feasible with surgery, uh, and the toxicity of surgery uh, compared to what is feasible with uh, SBRT and the toxicity of SBRT. The data, I mean, I may have, I'm outside of the SBRT field, obviously, so I may have too optimistic a view of that and, and you will hear um, from a better authority uh, on that later today. Uh, but, um, but the way I see it, I think if we're going to progress, uh, you know, and offer patients real benefit with ablation of oligometastatic sites, uh, it will probably be with radiotherapy approaches rather than surgical approaches. Uh, and the answer, of course, is out there. I mean, we need to get to that point where we have unbiased perspective data. So without unbiased perspective data, I think, you know, one can offer it, but with, with great care. Um, but yes, it's possible that with improving systemic therapy, and we all know that that's improving, you'll be hearing a lot about that. And I see that Dr. Zedan has come on, so maybe he would like to make a comment. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I, I think we need to do the trials. So I think you all have access to these patients. Uh, you have the resources to mount trials. You should do trials too. Um, I think there is also a question from uh, Dr. Marawi. I think going the same uh, way that in her two oligometastasis cases and with the success in achieving PCR breast uh, cancer patients, and we have uh, probably now more than one agent, a novel agent against the anti-HER2 treatment. And we know that there are a lot of patients who had uh, 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 very well controlled for long years. Uh, so more aggressive oligometastasis uh, uh, probably may not be required. I think um, this you already answered. Um, here there is a question. Would you recommend a surgical management for ipsilateral supraclavicular uh, lymph node and breast cancer metastatic disease? So if there is only the supraclavicular contralateral supraclavicular. Right. So there are people who have advocated that and who practice that. I think, uh, you know, I had a colleague who was trained at MD Anderson and she came back from there saying, uh, you know, this is an option for, for isolated supraclavicular metastases. I think the majority view there in, in, for that question, though, is that radiotherapy is a better approach. Um, and when we see these patients at Northwestern, we offer them radiotherapy, not surgery. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are on time. So thank you very much for your uh, kind of presentation. It was uh, very well uh, uh, done. And if you have, probably you have a couple of uh, uh, further questions, probably if you can answer it uh, uh, by, by written, it will be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asim. So we'll move to the next presentation and uh, uh, I'm delighted uh, to uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mikhail, um, who is uh, uh, an attending physician at uh, the medical uh, oncology department in uh, uh, Jules Brothers Institutes in Brussels. He's assistant to professors in the university. He's the leader of academic trials. Uh, he's interested in drug and biomarker development in breast cancer. Uh, his, uh, his work is widely recognized nationally and internationally. He's an investigator in the ORTC, uh, and he's had a special interest in the liquid uh, biopsy uh, approach and a member of uh, many society. He will uh, 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 present to us uh, today the optimizing uh, uh, first-line therapy of hormonal positive to negative in metastatic breast cancer. 
I think uh, this presentation will be uh, recorded. So if you have any questions, please uh, put it in the questions and answer and we will address it later on. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, so we're going to discuss about treatment optimization in first line uh, ER positive here to negative metastatic uh, breast cancer. These are my disclosures. And so in the uh, next 20 minutes, I'm going to discuss about um, uh, whether we should give CDK46 inhibitors to all patients in first line. Um, what is the optimal endocrine partner? Whether there is a place for these compounds as first line treatment following adjuvant CDK46 inhibitors? And what is and when is the right time to perform molecular testing, uh, including evaluation of PIK3CA mutations? So this slide summarizes the clinical trials of CDK46 inhibitors in advanced uh, ER positive disease. And you can see um, in first line, uh, we have a series of trials. We have an, uh, three trials in second or third line. And then uh, we have the monarchy for the heavily pretreated population. Now, if we go and look in more details, these uh, studies, and you see here in this uh, table in blue, uh, the studies in first line, you see a pretty consistent uh, benefit uh, in terms of progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of around 0.55 in favor of the CDK46 inhibitor R when this is added to endocrine treatment. Uh, and this was pretty consistent uh, whatever the CDK46 inhibitor uh, was used. Now in red, you see the two uh, studies in second line, again, the same benefit. And you see the Mona Lisa 3 study in which we had, again, similar benefit in first and second line. Now this is PFS, progression-free survival. Now this table um, shows overall survival, but also shows quality of life. And for metastatic breast cancer patients, an improvement in overall survival or quality of life is uh, what is needed. And actually, the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale that you see uh, uh, on the last line, um, it actually uh, it is based on uh, improvement in these uh, areas um, in order to give a score uh, to a treatment, to a drug, of whether this treatment or drug makes a difference. And the five is the higher score uh, that one can get. And as you can see here, um, this score um, was given uh, for um, the effect that the Bosiclib had in the Mona Lisa 7 trial. Uh, uh, remember, this is uh, the trial in premenopausal women. So it was the only trial uh, in premenopausal women in which uh, RIBO was given uh, together with ovarian suppression. And you see that there was an improvement both in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.76, but also in the quality of life. That's the reason that for these women, the premenopausal women, this drug, ribociclib, has uh, a, a, a score of five in the ESMO scale. Now, if we go to the other um, uh, studies, you see that if we have an improvement in quality of life, as in the Paloma 3, for instance, but no improvement on overall survival, uh, then the score is lower, it's four. Uh, and you see in Monarch 2 and in Mona Lisa 3, in which we had improvement in overall survival, but not in quality of life, then the score for, uh, for this in this setting for Ambema and Dribo is four. Now, there were questions uh, whether there are patient subgroups that do not benefit from these compounds. And this is an analysis by FDA. I tried to see if it was published, but I couldn't find the publication. But it was very interesting in, in the sense that it demonstrated 
that actually all subgroups that have been examined by FDA investigators when pooling uh, five CDK4-6 inhibitor trials demonstrated that the benefit was consistent in all subgroups. Uh, so in PR negative disease, uh, progesterone receptor negative disease, lobular cancer, patients with bone only metastasis, with the novel metastatic disease and with disease free interval of more than 12 months. So there was no subgroup in which there was no benefit from this compound. Now, in terms of toxicity, uh, uh, this study uh, published uh, two years ago demonstrated that there was a higher toxicity but similar efficacy when this class of agents were given to older women. And you can see from this table that in women that were older than 70 years, the um, uh, adverse events leading to treatment discontinuations were two times higher compared to younger women. And if we take a cutoff of women more than 75 years old, then this was three times higher. So similar benefit, however, increased toxicity. Uh, so we need to, uh, to be careful when we prescribe these agents in older patients. Now, the, the question on whether uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors needs to be given as first or second line treatment is currently being addressed by the SONIA trial in the Netherlands, in which women with, HER2 with estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative disease with no prior treatment are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion between either uh, AI followed by full Western and CDK4-6 inhibitor or uh, AI and CDK4-6 inhibitor followed by fulvestrin, with primary endpoint being progression-free survival after the two lines of treatment. Now, these uh, uh, studies, the results from this study are eagerly awaited. However, given the uh, benefit in terms of overall survival uh, in first-line setting, uh, that uh, you know, we have discussed before, many investigators uh, uh, prefer now giving these compounds as a first line setting. Now, the second question is, what is the optimal endocrine partner for uh, this class of agents for CDK46 inhibitor in the first line setting? Now, the results from the Falcon study that compared fulvestrant versus anastrozole, no CDK4-6 inhibitor in this study. This was an endocrine naive population, demonstrated that fulvestrant was better than anastrozole with a hazard ratio of 0 0.79. And this was uh, more pronounced in cases with non-visceral disease. However, how these results translate in patients that receive CDK46 inhibitors. Now, Parsifal study that reported in ASCO 2020 uh, gave the answer um, uh, at least partly to this question. Now, this study enrolled women with here positive disease, no prior therapy for advanced disease. They could be either pre or postmenopausal. And they need to be endocrine sensitive, defined as either endocrine naive or patients that had relapsed more than 12 months from the end of endocrine therapy. And these women were randomized in a one to one fashion, almost 500 women, to either fulvestrin and palbo versus letrozole and palbo. There was no difference in progression free survival. Uh, in favor of um, uh, any of, of the two arms with a hazard ratio of 1.13 uh, and a p-value that was not significant. And similarly, there was no subgroup uh, in which uh, one treatment was better than one endocrine partner was better than the other with a small trend in favoring full Western for patients 
that have been treated with prior aromatase inhibitor therapy. So what is the conclusions uh, from this study? That for endocrine naive or for patients that have relapsed more than a year after the end of adjuvant AI, uh, there is no evidence today that fulvestrant is a preferred partner compared to aromatase inhibitors. Now, for patients relapsing while receiving aromatase inhibitor therapy, fulvestrant may, may be the preferred endocrine partner um, in this setting. And for patients that have PICTCA mutations, AI may be the preferred partner for CDK46 inhibitors to start with since alpelisib is syndicated in combination with fulvestrant as second line treatment, and thus um, might make sense to, to, to start with AI so that one can then give fulvestrant uh, uh, in uh, uh, the alpelisib indication. The third question is whether there is a place for CDK46 inhibitors as first line following adjuvant CDK46 inhibitors. Currently, we do not have data from clinical trials for this question. And of course, we don't know whether um, uh, CDK46 inhibitors uh, will be reimbursed in the adjuvant setting. One might speculate that if this will be the case, then the longer the interval between the end of adjuvant CDK46 inhibitor and the diagnosis of metastatic disease, the higher the likelihood for benefit uh, in case of a challenge. But let's see uh, where we are in terms of the adjuvant CDK46 inhibitors trials. There are three studies, PALAS, Penelope B, and Monarch, that have reported results, and one study, the Natalie, that has not yet reported. Now, the Pallas and Penelope B with Palbo reported negative results at a three-year and four-year median follow-up. The Monarch E reported positive results at a two-year follow-up. However, as you can appreciate for Penelope B, the, at two years median follow-up, the study was also positive. But at four-year follow-up, the study was negative. So we don't really know whether at four-year follow-up, ABEMA will remain uh, positive, and then uh, the drug will have a place in the adjuvant setting, or we will see what we have seen uh, in the Penelope B trial. My last question and last point to discuss is, when is the right time to perform uh, molecular testing, including evaluation of PIC3CA mutation? PICTC imitation uh, is found in 40% of PR positive here to negative breast cancer and can be looked either in the tumor or circulating tumor DNA. And the concordance is pretty high between tumor and circulating tumor DNA, with only 17% of patients that have uh, discordant results based on this uh, study. And based on the SOLAR1 uh, study, uh, alpelisib uh, has been approved for uh, patients with PICTCA mutations um, uh, by FDA. Uh, and what you have seen here is, uh, what you see here is the design of the SOLAR1 uh, study in which um, uh, there were two cohorts, a mutant and non-mutant cohort. And for the mutant cohort, patients were randomized between fulvestrin and placebo versus fulvestrin and alpelisib. Same randomization for the non-mutant cohort. Primary endpoint, PFS in the mutant cohort. And as you can see uh, in, in these slides, uh, the results demonstrated an improvement in um, uh, they demonstrated an improvement in median progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.65 and, and a p-value that is highly significant. Now, 
uh, of note, uh, um, six percent of the patients were pretreated with CDK4-6 inhibitors. In terms of toxicity, uh, uh, toxicity was uh, mainly hyperglycemia uh, that now can be uh, easily managed. Uh, there was also diarrhea, 6.7% uh, grade three diarrhea, and rash, 10% uh, uh, rash with alpelicid. Uh, the majority of adverse events were grade one and two. There was no difference in patients reported out. More recently, we had the overall survival data published at Annals of Oncology. And now, as you see, there was no um, survival benefit. And given the fact that there was no improvement in quality of life, you see that this uh, drug takes three in the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale, um, since it does not improve overall survival and does not improve quality of life. In terms of subgroup analysis, there was an interesting finding uh, that patients with lung and liver metastasis uh, derived more benefit from uh, uh, alpelicid compared to, uh, to patients with bone metastasis. So this is uh, something interesting for our clinic. Now, since only 6% of patients had received CDK4-6 inhibitors in the SOLAR1 study, uh, uh, the BELIEVE study uh, was conducted. And here you see the cohort of patients, 120 patients, that have received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor and aromatase uh, inhibitor. And you see there that the median progression-free survival for this uh, patients that have been pre-treated with CDK4-6 inhibitors was 7.3 months when treated uh, with uh, full vester and alpelicid. And with a 50% uh, uh, of patients uh, without progression at six months. So take home messages. CDK4-6 inhibitors in combination with endocrine treatment is the preferred treatment option as first line treatment in uh, ER positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer patients. There seems to be no subgroup of patients that do not derive benefit from these compounds, with the exception of very uh, rare cases of patients with very indolent disease or uh, very oligometastatic disease that relapse many, many years after the end of adjuvant endocrine treatment. The choice of the endocrine partner can be guided by the interval between the end of adjuvant endocrine treatment and disease relapse. If we have patients progressing on AI, then it makes sense to shift to fulvestrin. The presence of PIK3CA mutations, in case PIK3CA mutations are present, one might want to uh, give um, uh, um, AI in this setting and of course, patient preferences. Uh, all patients need to be tested for PIK3CA mutations, ideally before starting first-line treatment for metastatic disease, uh, as this might affect later treatment options. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael, for this uh, comprehensive review of how we approach patients with uh, ERPR positive, HER2 negative, metastatic breast cancer. But we elect uh, to have the question and answer directly after each presentation because the presentations are not related to each other and we don't want to keep the speakers for this whole time. Okay. So we can have uh, probably a five minute questions and answer. Um, uh, we'll just, I'll, I'll have the first uh, question. Uh, for patients who usually have short uh, uh, progression after the combination with the CDK inhibitor, uh, probably those patients, maybe they are not hormonal positive or basal-like. Do you consider uh, going for BRCA uh, testing or you go for directly for chemotherapy or you still uh, 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 go for another line of hormonal treatment? So it depends. It depends uh, actually. So I, I would like 
to do the molecular testing up front to know, uh, first of all, whether they have P3CA mutations. Actually, I also looking at retinoblastoma loss, uh, retinoblastoma mutations, uh, although it's not like a, a level one evidence. So I do a comprehensive profiling. And then uh, it depends also on the, um, on the disease itself. So I, I had a patient that progressed rapidly and he had a, a relatively idolate disease. So it was a lobular cancer with a peritoneal metastasis. So uh, she had a PIC3CA mutation. So I was able to shift to full burst on alpelisib and he had a nice response there. I had another patient that he had no PIC3CA mutations, had actually a mutation in retinoblastoma. And there, the, 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 uh, the progression was very rapid, was a lot of liver metastasis. And there I, I shifted to Zaloda directly and I had a nice response. So I think it depends um, uh, what the molecular profile will say to me. What is the extent of the disease and the sites of the disease? And, um, and of course, uh, then uh, this is uh, the time from uh, treatment initiation to progression. Um, thank you. And uh, there is a question here uh, for one of the physicians saying that uh, he has patients with hyperglycemia. And we know that uh, Patients with diabetes are very frequently in our region. His uh, uh, blood sugar is 410, it's not uh, controlled well. Uh, I prescribed alpelisib for the patient uh, uh, with the I3 kinase uh, uh, mutation. So I think your recommendation is just to control diabetes before going there. Can you have your input? No, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I agree that um, uh, you, you, one needs to be careful and personally, if I have a patient that is, 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 is known not to have a well-controlled diabetes, I'm not giving this drug. Yeah, and, and I think it's causing even the incidence of hyperglycemia is much higher than mTOR inhibitors. So probably they have to have well-controlled uh, exactly. blood for the so safety. If, the if they don't have when before they start alpelisib, this is not a good candidate. Um, there is a, a question here again. Uh, if the patient progresses on CDK inhibitors, do you prefer going for alpelisib, fulvestrin, or examestin, everolimus? And I think you need also the PI3 kinase status to decide about this, right? Right. Very good question. If, if we have the PIC3CA status, that's why it's important to have it up front. Then, of course, I give alpelisib and fulvestrin. Now, if it's PIC3CA negative, then I can give aromazine and affinitor, or I can give another option uh, if, in case, as, as we said before, of a rapidly progressive disease, as you, as you have discussed, um, this then I can give Zaloda. Uh, but uh, definitely having the results of the molecular test at upfront is critical. Yeah, I think we, for the sake of time, we have this last uh, question. Even in metastatic male breast cancer, luminal type, uh, BRCA negative, which is the best hormonal uh, uh, combination uh, uh, you, you, you prefer? You know, actually, I had the male breast cancer patient and then treated with sequence of uh, uh, CDK46 and then alpelisib and responded well in, in, uh, in both treatments. So, um, uh, the, the, the one thing one needs to, to, to take into consideration in, in male breast cancer patients is when giving with, uh, uh, we need LHRA analogs for these patients. And this is something to, to not to forget. And the recommendation is just to treat the male breast cancer like female when you give LHRH agonist. And CDK inhibitors, I think, has been approved with palborecyclib and other CDK, mainly on the world data uh, Exactly. So both are, are, are uh, uh, recommended. So thank you very much for this uh, uh, good review and cover for the presentation. Uh, and I think there is uh, two more couple of questions, if you can answer it uh, 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 by, by, uh, by answering question, it will be highly preferable. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so uh, much. Thanks. Thanks.
We'll move to the th third presentation, and uh, I'm delighted to present uh, Dr. Sayed Hamad. Uh, he is uh, a consultant medical oncologist. He graduated uh, from UK. Uh, he worked uh, in the Royal uh, Wolverhampton uh, Hospital in UK for three years before joining Dubai Hospital, and he's the chairman of oncology there. Um, he will uh, share with us uh, the new anti HER2 treatment in metastatic breast cancer. So please, uh, Dr. Said. Good evening. Thank you very much for asking me to talk about today the treatment of HER2 positive uh, metastatic breast cancer. This is a 20 minute talk. Uh, we'll just touch on what are the current standards of care uh, and then we'll look at the, some of the new data which is available. So these are the disclaimers. So let's navigate through patients with HER2 positive breast cancer and what is a patient journey. So I'll just briefly talk about an early breast cancer first and what are the current standard of care. So when we look at the HER2 positive early breast cancer, um, on diagnosis, most of the patients have a locally advanced disease or they are not positive, but there could be a small number of patients uh, which are very early small tumors. And these patients could undergo upfront surgery followed by the adjuvant treatment based on the outcome of the final pathology. However, for majority of the patients, uh, they will receive new adjuvant treatment followed by surgery and then you would decide what adjuvant treatment you're going to offer based on the outcome of your treatment in the new adjuvant setting. Let's have a look at uh, the data and decide how we're going to manage our patients. So this was a, a small phase two study. And this is a study looking at adjuvant trastuzumab and taxol in patients with these small node negative tumors. This is a single arm study. In this study, uh, they avoided the use of anthocyclines, which we know has risk associations. Uh, with regards to cardiac toxicity. This study actually was uh, uh, published back in 2017, and we had the results of disease-free survival at three years, which were very significant at 98%. And if you see by seven years, uh, it was again very good at 93.3%. So this, this data gave us some, co some confidence that we could use anthracycline free, free regimen in some of our patients with very small early node negative tumors who have upfront surgery. However, for majority of our patients who receive new adjuvant treatment, now the standard of care has become dual anti HER2 targeted treatment. These are the trials which uh, were the landmark and set the standards that we currently uh, practice. So, back in 2012 and 2013, uh, we had the data of New Sphere study. On the left side of the screen, as you can see in this study, dual anti HER2 blockage with Herceptin and Pertuzumab improved path CR when compared with Herceptin plus chemotherapy alone. If you, if you look at uh, uh, the results, up to 40% path CR rate with the combination of Perchetta, Herceptin, and, trans, uh, and Taxane. Uh, you would note that uh, half of the chemotherapy, i.e., FAC, was given. Uh, after the operation. Trifena on the right side was the safety study. In this study, all of the chemotherapy along with uh, dual HER2 was given in the new adjuvant setting and we can see very high path CR rates from 56% to 63%. Affinity, uh, this was back in 2017 now, uh, data for adjuvant dual anti HER2 uh, therapy with, per, uh, with Perjecta and Herceptin. Uh, this study showed the risk of invasive disease free survival was reduced by 28%, especially in patients with node positive groups. So on the left side of your, of your screen, if you can see patients uh, group with node positive, um, at three years, the invasive disease free survival was reduced by 23%, and this was maintained at six years. Uh, which showed uh, that 28% reduction. And this really set the standard for our patients in the adjuvant setting. Um, 
However, in the node negative group, uh, there was no significant uh, benefit. You would remember Catherine's study. Uh, this is uh, two years ago now, which demonstrated the benefit of adapting treatment after the new adjuvant treatment. So patients who had residual disease after new adjuvant therapy were uh, compared with TDM1 versus trastuzumab in this study. Again, very significant results at three years, the risk of invasive disease survival was improved by 11.3%. So TDM1 reduced the risk of uh, invasive disease survival by 50% when compared with trastuzumab. And this has now become a standard of care for our patients. What about patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer? So what are the standards of care? And what is the key uh, data which is uh, uh, giving us this confidence? So uh, we know uh, that uh, dual anti HER2 blockage uh, plus taxin has become a standard first line treatment uh, followed by TDM1 and then subsequent lines of therapy. We look at the data uh, uh, which gives us uh, the evidence of use of these drugs, and we'll also look at the current uh, recommendations for different uh, uh, societies. Cleopatra study, uh, back in 2012, 2015, we had the data. This study established the role of uh, pertuzumab and trastuzumab as a standard of care in the first-line setting for patients with metastatic uh, breast cancer. On your left side, the primary analysis of uh, progression free survival with a very significant hazard ratio of 0 0.62. Um, and the progression free survival improved from 12.4 months to 18, 18.5 months. And if you look on the right side, the final um, overall survival uh, that also improved from 40 months to 56.5 uh, months. So almost 15 months overall survival benefit uh, with the addition of uh, 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 pertuzumab uh, to the standard of care. So this, uh, this study also uh, uh, showed us the safety, uh, including the long-term cardiac safety, which was maintained at eight years. So now we have data up to 99.9 months uh, follow-up. And in this study, the overall survival at eight years uh, was 37% in patients with PhD. Following uh, these uh, landmark trials, a number of other trials were carried out, which provided additional support to the role of uh, pertuzumab and, tra and trastuzumab as a standard of care in the first line uh, setting in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast uh, cancer. What are the guidelines um, regarding first-line treatment? So we have NCSC guidelines, the ASMO guidelines, as well as the ASCO guidelines. All of these guidelines do recommend now uh, the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab along with the taxane as a standard first-line treatment in patients with metastatic or recurrent HER2-positive uh, breast cancer. What about second-line setting? These are the two uh, landmark studies, Emilia and Theresa study, which established the role of TDM1 as a standard of care in the second line setting. On the left side, left side we have the Emilia study, and this study uh, uh, presented the primary analysis of uh, progression free survival, which improved from 6.4 months versus 9.6 months. Uh, in this study, uh, TDM1 was compared with lipatinib and capecitabine, which was the standard of care at that time, and uh, with very positive results. And the, on the right side, we have the Theresa study. In this study, TDM1 was compared with the physician's choice chemotherapy. Again, very um, uh, positive outcomes. Progression free survivors in the Theresa study improved from 3.3 to 6.2 months. The overall survival also was improved in both the study. So in the Amelia study, it was 29.9 months compared with 25.9 months in the control group. And in the Theresa study, it, uh, it was 22.7 months uh, with the TDM1 versus a control, which was 15.8 months. 
Interestingly, the incidence of grade three adverse events leading to dose reduction were lower with the TDM ones. So the TDM one was found to be safer than the standard of care. There was then additional studies looking at um, the role of TDM one. And these studies again supported the role of TDM1 in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Let's look at the guidelines. So we have the NCCN guidelines, the ASMA and, and the ASCO guidelines. All of these guidelines really recommend the use of TDM1 as a standard of care for the treatment of patients in the second line setting in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. So what is new? So um, there's evolving uh, treatment paradigm. A number of new studies have been uh, published recently and we have approvals. I'll briefly take you through this data. So these are the recent approvals. Uh, so we had Tocotinib uh, approved in April 2020 by the FDA, followed by the approval by the Swiss Medic in May 2020. Uh, we also had the approval of Trastuzumab Duroxtecan uh, in back in December 2019, and then more recently, in, it was approved in Japan in March 2020. I'll show you the, uh, uh, the results of these two uh, drugs. So her 2 climb uh, is the pivotal study which uh, evaluated to cartonib uh, uh, with capecitabine and trastuzumab in patients with her 2 positive metastatic breast cancer. These are the patients who are uh, heavily pretreated with trastuzumab, pertuzumab, or TDM1. Uh, they stratified the patient with performance status, uh, and a baseline MRI was done uh, as well. 612 patients were, in, uh, were included in the study. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study was progression free survival, and there were a number of secondary endpoints including progression-free survival in patients with brain metastasis, overall survival, progression-free survival, response rate, and duration of response. Of note, if you look at 48% of the patient had brain metastasis, after, after them, about 60% had active brain metastasis. The patient were randomized to H21 into tocotinib plus capecitabine and trastuzumab versus uh, capecitabine and trastuzumab. So this study met its primary endpoint of progression with survival in the overall population. If you look on the left side, it improved from 5.6 to 7.8 months with the hazard ratio 0 0.54 and with the significant p-value. So uh, this combination improved the PFS by 2.2 months. And then we also had the results of the overall survival again uh, the overall sur survival improved by 5.4 months um, with tocotinib versus placebo, and this was statistically significant. What about patients with brain metastasis? As I showed you earlier, about half the patient had brain metastasis. So in patients who had brain metastasis, really the benefit was maintained, and the combination improved the PFS by 2.2 two months um, as well as the overall survival by 6.1 months. So as you can see in the graphs as well, uh, the hazard ratio is 0 0.48 for PFS, which was statistically significant, as well as the overall survival, uh, which improved from 12 months to 18.1 months. So very uh, good outcome uh, for patients with brain metastasis. What about toxicity? So the most common grade three adverse events uh, in the tocotinib arm were hand foot syndrome, diarrhea, and impaired liver function. The most common adverse event uh, was the diarrhea. That was manageable with anti so, so if you look at diarrhea, 80%, any grade 12.9% grade three. If you compare that with placebo, it was 53% uh, any grade and 8.6 uh, grade three. If you look at liver enzymes, 21% uh, uh, AST, um, any grade, 4.5% grade three or more. When you compare that with placebo, uh, almost half, 11% any grade and half a percent grade three. So there is some uh, liver toxicity with this drug with, that you need to look out for. 
this was then uh, endorsed by um, FDA and the Swiss medic, and as well as it become part of the NCCN guidelines, which do recommend now uh, to cut a, uh, as a second line plus treatment option in patient with uh, metastatic how to positive breast cancer. And CCN also actually gives this an option for patients with brain metastasis who have received prior one or two lines of anti her 2 targeted therapy. Second study um, uh, on the drug, which was approved for trastuzumab duroxetecan. This is a next generation ADC, so antibody drug conjugate with the very highly potent chemotherapy payload. This was tested, tested in destiny study. This is a phase two study. Uh, which has part one and part two. Part one was the uh, uh, basically looking at the dose of the drug. So these are the patients who are heavily pretreated uh, with anti-HER2 treatment as well as TDM1. Uh, in this study, the primary endpoint was overall response rate. And the secondary endpoint was disease control rate, clinical benefit rate, duration of response. And they also looked at the PFS and OS. So part one was divided into PK stage and then the dose finding study. And then part two was the continuation study. Let's look at the results. So response rate by the uh, independent um, measures. So this study uh, met its primary endpoint with the response rate of 60.9% in the ITT population. Complete response was 6% and the partial response 54.9% and 36.4% patient has stable disease. The disease control rate was 97.3%, very significant. And if you look at clinical benefit, at six months was 76%. So this study had demonstrated a response rate up to 61% and this was uh, durable. So very significant results for these patients who are heavily pre-treated. Let's look at the patients uh, with brain metastasis. So this is a small number of patients with brain metastasis were included. So on the, on the left side, seen a subgroup of 24 patients, which showed the median uh, follow-up up to 11 months. And then PFS. Um, and on the right side, we have the overall population. Although very similar outcomes, the median PFS was 18.1 months in the CNS subgroup uh, and 16.4 months in the overall population. However, the numbers were small in the CNS group with the wide confidence interval. Important thing to, uh, that came out of the study was uh, the interstitial lung disease um, uh, and this toxicity. So uh, about 25 uh, patients had uh, interstitial lung disease events. And uh, so that's about 13.6%. Uh, Out of these patients, seven patients recovered. Uh, there were two patients who were recovering and 12, we did not have the known outcome. And we have four fatal cases. And so it is very important uh, that we should look out for this toxicity and their recommendations for management of interstitial lung disease. If your patient develops uh, pneumonitis, which is grade two or higher, you should permanently discontinue uh, the drug. So now we have the approvals and the recommendations uh, from the FDA in the third line plus setting in patient with metastatic breast cancer. The NCCN also warns you that it is contraindicated for patients with pneumonitis or interstitial lung disease. Let's uh, put all of these uh, drugs in one chart and compare their toxicity. So on your left side, we have the um, Perjeta and Herceptin plus Taxane, uh, standard of care in the first line setting. The most common adverse events were, are diarrhea, alopecia, nausea, and fatigue. And we, when we look at the safety profile versus control, grade three and more neutropenia and febrile neutropenia were higher with the pH versus control. However, they were lower grades of grade three left ventricular dysfunction. 
TD1 um, in the second line setting, grade three and four thrombocytopenia and elevated level enzymes you need to look out for. However, grade three adverse events were lower with the TDM1 versus the control as we saw in the studies. Well, what about tocotinib? Uh, again, this drug uh, uh, causes diarrhea, elevated liver enzymes, and hand, hand foot syndrome. Hand foot syndrome could be uh, secondary to Zeloda, as we are aware. However, the grade three adverse events were higher with tocotinib versus the placebo. Then finally, we have trastuzumab duroxtecan in the third line plus setting. Grade three and higher events for neutropenia, anemia, and nausea. However, 15% of patients had treatment discontinuation due to adverse events, and we need to watch out for interstitial lung disease, the risk of which could be up to 13.6%, and there's uh, mortality associated with it. What about the CNS activity of KDM1? So we have the data from Theresa, Emilia, and, and Camilla studies. A uh, small number of patients were included in this study with brain metastasis, so about 11 to 20 percent. So in the Theresa study, the median progression for survival in patients with brain metastasis was, was 5.8 months, and median overall survival was 17.3 months. In the Amelia study, the median uh, overall survival was 26.8 months. So TDM1 has well-established efficacy and safety profile, uh, including patients with brain metastasis, which were included in these studies. When we look at tocotinib and transfusum and ruxumab, so our two climb is the tocotinib study. Almost half of the patients had brain metastasis in this particular study. And in this study, the median PFS was 7.6 months and OS was 18.1 months with significant hazard ratio. And the response rate, intracranial response rate was up to 47% in patients with active brain metastasis. In the destiny study, uh, about 13% of patients have brain metastasis. The median PFS was 18.1 month in patients with brain metastasis. And the duration of, of response was 16 0.9 months. So these both of these drugs are active in patients with brain metastasis. So what to look for in the future? Um, so there are multiple ongoing planned uh, studies in the HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. I've shared you the data of Destiny and HER2 climb study. We also now have data available for Monarch HER, uh, which is a phase two study as well as the SOFIA study. Uh, these both of these uh, uh, combinations are not yet approved. However, we do have data available. And then there are a number of other ongoing studies. I'll briefly share you a slide regarding uh, these two studies. So the Monarch and Sophia, both of these studies met their primary endpoint. On the left side of your screen, we have the Monarch HER study. This is really the first study looking at CTK4 in inhibitor plus uh, hormone therapy um, and trastuzumab at the third line setting in patients with hormone positive metastatic breast cancer. So in this study, they use abimacyclib plus herceptinib plus full restraint, which improved the progression free survival when compared with herceptin and, and chemotherapy. So it was 8.3 versus 5.7 month, and the drug was generally well tolerated. So really first evidence of use of CDK4 in, 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 a, in a trial setting. On the right side, we have the SOFIA study. And this is a phase three study of Mergatuximab plus chemotherapy versus the uh, Herceptin and the chemotherapy of physician choice in the second line uh, setting. And this study showed 25% PFS risk reduction with the new agent. Uh, there was small but non-significant survival benefit, and the safety profile was similar between the treatment arms. So hopefully we'll soon be looking at um, the approvals and the recommendation from the, from the uh, international societies. So in summary, uh, pertuzumab and trastuzumab plus taxane is the standard of care in the first line setting in patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. And this was demonstrated in the Cleopatra study 
which had the long-term efficacy and safety data after eight years follow-up. TDM1 has become a standard second line, and this was based on the data for Emilia and Teresa studies with an acceptable safety profile. Now, we also have recent approvals of molecules such as tucatinib and trastuzumab bruxtecan, uh, which have provided us further options beyond the second line in uh, patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. Especially now we have data in patients with brain metastasis uh, with tucatinib, which is which will be becoming a new standard of care. And, and hopefully in the future, a number of new studies are going to be presented and approvals. Thank you very much. And that's uh, where I'm going to complete my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Said, for this uh, overview. <clears throat> Just a question, you know that uh, the receptors are changing sometimes with HER2 positive disease. And we know we, know, we have uh, now the TDM1 and we have the Rexetican. Both are drug conjugates. So if we lose the receptors, those drugs may not uh, work. So do you routinely do a rebiopsy or in special cases, you consider the rebiopsy before starting these agents? Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, we do consider rebiopsy, especially if there's a disease-free interval. Uh, and if there's a relapse after a few years, we do consider doing the biopsy again because sometimes we do find surprises. So I think it's a good practice to consider uh, rebiopsying if possible. Yeah, the other questions, uh, they said that the five-year survival now uh, uh, rate is better than the luminal, the ARPR positive uh, uh, breast cancer. Do you agree? I think it is look it is improving every year with these new drugs coming up. I think we were previously we had the dilemma of what to do after second line, and for most of us was just using Herceptin with another chemotherapy, and now we have the new combinations coming in which are improving the survival further. I think there's a big competition between uh, HER2 positive and ER positive breast cancer in the, in the metastatic setting. I think the outcomes are much better now. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamad. I really apologize from the people uh, putting a lot of questions because for the limit of time, uh, uh, we may answer this slightly, but the rest will be answered by the speaker uh, uh, on the side. Thank you, Dr. Hamad. Uh, we'll move to the third presentation. I'm really delighted and honored to present uh, 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 Professor Hamdi Abdul Azim. He's a professor of oncology. Uh, he's past chairman of the oncology department of faculty of medicine in Cairo University and also he's a chair in Kasr al-Aini Oncology. He's the founder of the Africa Middle East uh, 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 Cancer Intergroup, uh, the MC, which is the first cancer research organization in the region. And he's uh, the chair of the steering committee of the NCCN guidelines. He has a lot of publication. He's a reference uh, for us uh, as an oncology uh, in the region. So he's national as well as international. He will uh, 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 present to us the treatment option for the first line treatment in uh, triple negative metastatic breast cancer. Uh, must welcome uh, Dr. Hamdi and uh, the floors of yours. So thank you for having us and we hope that we'll see you soon. Hassan, thank you so much for your kind invitation and your introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, I wish next year we'll be together, inshallah, in face. So my, my task has, uh, I, I was told that uh, I need to cover what we, we should discuss uh, when it comes to first-line treatment of uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So to start with, that's my disclosure. And uh, because chemo still stands as a a, a, a main stay in the management of, of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, although we have other options at the present time, but let's first discuss what we, we have uh, as, as chemotherapy with a very uh, uh, important question. Do we have something called the best chemo for triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic phase? Actually, this, this question was, was posed by the uh, uh, TNT study, which was presented several years ago. Uh, and it, it has a very brilliant uh, 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 design. Uh, they included triple negative breast cancer in the first line setting uh, with, with, with some of the patients uh, with non BRCA mutation status, not, not much actually, only around 12% of, of the population. And in a head to head comparison, CARBO, which is a very 
popular drug in people next to breast cancer versus uh, docetaxel in, in a full dose each. And we have seen that in, in the overall population, there was no difference in overall uh, response rate, which was the primary endpoint. But in the subgroup analysis, there was a significant benefit seen in, in, in BRCA mutant patients where, where carbo actually could produce more than double of the overall response rate in, with, uh, seen with Ducitaxel. Uh, no, no, no similar benefit, of course, was seen in, in BRCA non-mutant. And similarly, there, there was a, a, a very clear trend in favor of the prolongation of carboplatin-induced uh, progression-free survival compared to Ducitaxel. And in, in, in another beautiful subgroup analysis in this uh, particular trial, uh, uh, they, they segregated the patients according to their genomic profile, either basal or non-basal. And as you can see, in, in basal-like uh, uh, profile genomics, uh, the two drugs are doing the same job, uh, while look at the non-basal, which is in around 20% of the population. Uh, the, the performance of, of Ducitaxel was, was pretty good, while the performance of, of uh, carboplatin was, was, was really uh, modest. Uh, the overall survival uh, uh, was, was the same, so it doesn't make a difference when it comes to overall survival for the, for the total population. But the, the recommendation was very strong that uh, you, you have to pay atten attention to the presence of BRCA mutation. Uh, in the choice of your uh, uh, first-line treatment in triple negative breast cancer, where carboplatin can, can really do a good job for your patients with BRCA mutation. And importantly, in my opinion, uh, this piece of information where Ducitaxel in the non-basal actually is a very good drug in triple negative breast cancer, although we do not make a, a real use of this piece of information. Anyway, since combination chemotherapy still stands as important, uh, 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 treatment decision in, in symptomatic uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And since for, for so many years, we, we use carbo and gemcitabine as the standard of care in this population, uh, then uh, the, uh, the TNACity uh, study, which was published three years ago, uh, compared in a head to head comparison, this uh, popular regimen, carbo gem, versus uh, carbo again with napaclitaxel with a third arm or utilizing non-platinum combination napaclitaxel plus gemcitabine. As we have seen in this trial that the winner was napaclitaxel when it comes to the progression-free survival better than the other two options. And when it comes to overall response rate, as you can see, the overall response rate uh, when compared to the gem carbo was more than 25%, almost 25% difference. And uh, in overall survival, because as you, you know, that's a, a small uh, phase two trial. Uh, again, there was a trend in favor of the napaclitaxel compared to Jim Carbo with, with a hazard ratio of uh, 0.08. Uh, the, the Chinese group uh, in, 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 in the last ISMO, they, they, they provided their phase three trial uh, comparing again napaclitaxel platinum with gym cis uh, and the progression free survival was the primary endpoint. You can see again exactly what we have seen in the prior trial that uh, napaclitaxel plus platinum uh, has a significantly better progression free survival, very, very same uh, hazard ratio like the previous study. Again, a trend for improvement in, in overall survival, not significant that the number of, of the patients uh, ca cannot allow for this. But important for me is the overall response rate again for napaclitaxel platinum compared to gym platinum was around 25% higher. Again, very similar uh, uh, results to what we have seen in the phase two trial. So should we use napaclitaxel as a standard treatment in triple negative breast cancer and not paclitaxel? I, I, I don't know, but we have one trial that attempted to see whether or not any of, of, of the taxins is better. And as you can see in this uh, CLGB trial published several years ago, napaclitaxel with beva versus paclitaxel with beva. And the outcome, as you can see, that there was no difference in triple negative 
breast cancer if you use paclitaxel or not paclitaxel with, with, with BEVA. So beyond chemo and BEVA, which they are still important, we, 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 we have seen during the, the, the several few years that uh, many, many studies, they try to dissect supernegative breast cancer according to their genomics and the molecular oscillations. And in, in general, we divide uh, 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 triple negative breast cancer into basal and non-basal. The majority are basal around three quarters. Uh, importantly, in the basal, we have much more mutation burden compared to non-basal. But in subsequent trials or, or genomic analysis uh, directed towards the triple negative breast cancer, we, we can divide triple negative breast cancer genomically into three major categories. Uh, again, basal-like, and mesenchymal and androgen receptor possible, which we call luminal triple negative breast cancer. Actually, uh, th this subdivision uh, 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 is, is extremely important when it comes to the choice of therapy, because you can see in, in, the, in the basal like, you have a high response rate in the basal type one, while poor response rate to chemo in the basal type two, we have in the mesenchymal modest response to chemo and androgen receptor positive, we have poorest response to chemo, especially to platinum. Importantly, we have uh, enrichment with many different uh, uh, genetic alterations. Uh, they, they differ dramatically from one subtype to other subtypes, as you can see here in blue. And again, their enrichment with the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes it is totally different where uh, the basal-like and less so the mesenchymal, they have enrichment with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, while the androgen receptor, for instance, uh, positive, they do not have much of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So let's focus first on this category, enrichment of DNA damage response, uh, and including uh, homologous recombination repair defects. Uh, we know that the presence of HRD would, would automatically guide us to think of, uh, of the use of PARP inhibitors uh, in, in patients with BRCA mutations. And we have seen two studies coming during the last few years, the Olympiad study that uh, compared the uh, uh, Olaparib versus chemo, non-platinum chemo. Uh, of course, the progression-free survival looks beautifully in favor of the Olaparib. Uh, look at this, median time to response is as short as chemo, so they are rapidly acting drugs. What was not really good is the duration of response in this, in this particular trial, which was not difference, no difference in the duration of response between olaparib and chemo. The second study, the Embraca, which has similar design, again, we have seen similar improvement in progression-free survival, in, in favor of uh, telazuparib compared to chemo, again, non-platinum chemo, uh, the response rate is much higher as, as we have seen in the Olympiad. Uh, uh, in, in this particular trial, the, the duration of response was significantly better in favor of uh, telazuparib. But what was not good actually is that the overall survival at the mature analysis was not better than, than, than chemo. Uh, what was good, again, in, in the two studies uh, was the improvement in the quality of life, which would put together with improvement in uh, uh, overall response rate and prolongation of progression-free survival, which would put these two, two, two drugs uh, as uh, good options for the treatment of patients with BRCA mutations. Uh, the third study, the BROCAD-3 study, was different because it combined uh, PARP inhibitors with, with uh, chemo, carbo, paclitaxel. But as you can see, the, the utilization, because we, are, we cannot really combine PARP inhibitors in a full dose with chemo. So in, in this trial, the baliparib was, was given in a small dose, 100 milligrams BID, for only seven days during the chemo treatment. Mind you, the, 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 the dose, the, the, the usual dose of the drug as single agent is 400 milligrams daily and non-stop. So it's, it's, a, it's quite small dose. But anyway, that was the design compared with placebo plus carbo and paclitaxel again. Uh, in, in this particular trial, patients after finishing 
their chemo regimen. Uh, 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 they were maintained with uh, Bariparib in, 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 in a larger dose, in the classical dose or placebo. Uh, as you can see, there was improvement in progression-free survival in, in favor of the Bariparib combination. But if you have a look on the, on the, on the shape of the progression-free survival curves, you can see that during the chemo treatment, the, the induction treatment, there was no difference actually whether you added valiparip or not during the first 10 months. But then during the maintenance period, which started after chemo, you can see now if you maintain with a full dose of valiparip, actually you could separate the progression-free survival in favor of the combination. So you can consider this as a sort of maintenance uh, rather than induction by PARP inhibitors. Anyway, uh, if you have a look on the, on the overall response rate in either arm, it is pretty well uh, around 75%, clinical benefit around 90% or 90 plus, so very impressive. Duration of response for the chemo alone was 11 months versus 14 months for the combination. So because we have to cover first-line treatment of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we have a lot of caveats in all the studies utilizing uh, PARP inhibitors uh, because the design and data, they cannot tell you exactly the, uh, the performance of the PARP inhibitors in the first-line setting of uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. To start with, the first-line population in the three studies was different. 30% uh, of the Olympiad, the 38 in the Embraca, 81 in the Brocat. But triple negative population in the three studies were around 50%. So the only studies that provided kaplan meier curves for the progression-free survival of a PARP inhibitor in triple negative breast cancer was the, uh, the Olympiad trial. As you can see in the triple negative breast cancer, the, the, the Oliparip was was significantly better uh, uh, than chemo. So if you wish to treat by in triple-negative breast cancer, then it, it, it will help you a lot compared to chemo. And the overall response rate in triple-negative breast cancer was, uh, uh, was much higher, whether you use oliparib or telazuparib, much higher than chemo, although the brocad they did not provide the, this subgroup for triple-negative breast cancer. Anyway. First line, platinum, or PARP inhibitors, what we do. We have to, 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 to remember what we have seen with, with, with carboplatina in the TNT study, because uh, uh, carboplatina is a monotherapy, a very available drug, and quite uh, 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 non-expensive medication. It provided us with the overall response rate of 60% uh, in triple-negative BRCA mutant, progression-free survival around seven months, which is pretty uh, close to the PARP inhibitors. The caveats, of course, are, are plenty. First of all, the TNT, it was a first line, which is important, but the number of BRCA mutant population was, was quite low. Uh, while in the PARP inhibitor studies, uh, a single agent, the majority, they received their treatment uh, beyond first line, and they included patients with uh, triple negative and luminal breast cancer as well. So my own view in the first line setting of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, of course, the two approved PARP inhibitors may certainly be used as first line. Uh, they, they provide better quality of life. They provide higher response rate, although the duration of response is pretty short and we do not have overall survival data in favor of this. Uh, but in my opinion, if you don't have a PARP inhibitor, uh, the BROCAT3 told us that uh, carboplatin paclitaxel as uh, a combination chemotherapy in patients with BRCA mutation, they provided overall response rate of 70 plus percent, uh, clinical benefit of 90 percent, duration of response of 11 percent. So if you, if you don't have a PARP inhibitor or if your patient is is really symptomatic. Maybe this combination can provide a, a good answer for your patients. When we move to immune checkpoint inhibitors, we know that uh, in, in, in triple negative breast cancer as monotherapy, they are not very impressive, especially in the second line, they are pretty modest. But in the first line, the response rate is, is not bad. 
is not very impressive. It is in the range of 25% if your patient is PTL1 positive. And uh, the duration of responses is, is, is around one year. But actually, we th I think combination with chemo what was very clearly needed. And in the preclinical model, we have seen that a drug like atul uh, atezolizumab had beautiful synergy with, with, with napaclitaxel, for instance. And this uh, promoted the, 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 the introduction of this combination in the Impassion 130, which included atezol, napaclitaxel versus placebo, napaclitaxel. Uh, uh, importantly, they, 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 they mandated that the, the treatment-free interval after the adjuvant treatment should be could exceed one year. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival and overall survival uh, in the intent to treat and uh, pd one positive population. We have seen the results several times in the intent to treat that the, 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 there was some modest improvement, but in the subgroup analysis, the improvement was strictly seen in patients with pd one positive. Uh, by immunohistochemistry using the, the, the Ventana uh, SP142 uh, uh, SA. And importantly, in patients with PD1 negative, no benefit at all. And the test of interaction was highly significant, which means that PD1 positivity is a significant prerequisite if you wish to have a benefit of the addition of uh, 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 atezolizumab to, to napaclitaxel. The, the improvement again was seen in, in overall response rate, although the duration of response was, was, was not sig significantly longer, but it was anyway numerically longer. In the overall survival, again, as exactly what we have seen in, in the progression free survival, a, a, a very significant and, in my opinion, uh, uh, clinically relevant improvement. In, uh, in overall survival, uh, around eight month uh, improvement in overall survival in, in favor of, uh, of the use of atelizumab. But in PDL1 negative, as we have seen, the, the, a zero benefit. So the take home message was very clear. This combination is very important uh, for, for patients PDL1 positive, which uh, they, they make around 40% of the total population of metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And that's why the, this combination was approved by the FDA. But the only caveat was is that uh, napaclitaxel is not a very popular drug in the vast majority of the cancer uh, centers across the world. So it was important to test whether we have similar benefits uh, seen with, with, with atezolizumab uh, when combined with the, with the more uh, a regular taxane, the, the, the paclitaxel, weekly paclitaxel, and that, that's why the, the design of the Impassion 131 was made. Again, the same inclusion criteria, patients who relapsed after more than one year from the end of adjuvant treatment, similar stratification factors, but with the use of paclitaxel instead of napaclitaxel, again, placebo controlled, and uh, unfortunately, uh, in patients with PD1 positive, as you can see, that there was no improvement at all in, in progression-free survival uh, in, in the atezo arm compared to placebo. And again, uh, uh, the, the improvement in, in overall uh, response rate was pretty modest, um, only 8% versus 16% in the impassion 130 uh, using uh, napaclitaxel. Uh, what was more even worse is, is the overall survival, there was uh, some trend uh, uh, against the use of atezo in, in this combination. Uh, the bottom line, we failed to, 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 to provide the paclitaxel as a good partner uh, with atezo in, in, in this indication. And the reasons for, what, for, for, for this failure, I cannot really explain. But uh, the take home message is clear. If you wish to give um, atezo in the first line setting in PD1 positive, then use it with napaclitaxel and not with paclitaxel. During the same year, which is the last year, we have uh, two, two, two times the presentation of the uh, uh, Keynote 355, 
in the ASCO and then subsequently in San Antonio. Uh, it has similar aim, but not the, the same design. Uh, the 355 uh, included first line patients metastatic triple negative breast cancer, but uh, they, uh, they allow patients who really uh, relapsed early uh, uh, after longer than six months, not one year. So they included the somewhat more difficult to treat population. And the second difference was the, the chemotherapy backbone, uh, where they, they, they allowed the investigator to use either uh, napaclitaxel or paclitaxel, or the, the, the more uh, popular regimen in triple negative breast cancer, which is gem carbo. Uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, the stratification factor was according to the chemo, the PDL1 positivity, and uh, uh, use the same chemo during the adjuvant, yes or no. The primary endpoint was progression free survival done in a hierarchical way, and the same was the overall survival. So the population which was PDL1 positive, which we call in the triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic phase, truly positive. Uh, combined score 10 or more was around 40%, like what we have seen with uh, with uh, with Atizo. And they are in this particular trial, uh, they they included patients who relapsed early in something like 20% of the population. Uh, we have seen that in the in this in in the truly positive PDL1, which is 10 or more combined the proportion score. The hazard ratio was very similar to the impassion 130, a, a very significant p-value and prolongation of, of progression-free survival by 35% uh, in the range of four month improvement. But in the intent to treat, uh, the improvement wa was not significant and ve very similar hazard ratio like we have seen in the intent to treat patients in, in the impassion 130, the same hazard ratio. 0.82 uh, and here 0.8. So in the intent to treat, it looks better, but it is not actually uh, better when it comes to statistical significance. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, in, in, the, in the subgroup analysis of uh, uh, patients with PD1 positive uh, 10 or more, the, the, whether you use the taxane or gem carbo, uh, it, 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 it went fine for the patients. For the uh, overall response rate, there was a significant improvement in overall response rate. And if you subdivide, uh, uh, if you have a look on the response duration in this population, again, the response duration was, was pretty longer here in this study in favor of the combination uh, uh, compared to, to chemo alone. And for the subgroup analysis, whether napaclitaxel or paclitaxel or gem carbo, you can see that actually, irrespective to the chemo partner, uh, the, 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 the performance of pembrolizumab plus napaclitaxel or paclitaxel or gem carbo, it went fine, although paclitaxel seemed to be uh, the, the best partner for, for this particular trial. So based on this trial, actually, the, 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 uh, the pem pembrolizumab was, was approved to be used in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer with combined score uh, uh, 10 or more. And the performance, in my opinion, the most important piece of, uh, of the conclusion in this trial is that the performance of Paclitaxel and Pembro was at least as good as Napaclitaxel uh, uh, and Pembro. What is not really uh, concluded in this study as yet is whether or not we are able to improve the overall survival with this combination Yes or no, we don't know because the, 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 the study as yet did not report the overall survival data. The final thing is, uh, do you expect that uh, we have better outcome with immune checkpoint inhibitors in the adjuvant phase compared to uh, what we have seen in the metastatic? What we have seen in the metastatic, patients with pd one negative, no benefit at all. But if you have a look on, on from the lab, on the, on the quality of, of, and quantity of TILs in the primary P or metastatic M, you can see that in the preclinical model, we have much higher TILs in patients with uh, 
uh, uh, with, with primary triple negative breast cancer compared to metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And uh, uh, the, the quality of the TILS, not only the quantity, is much better when it comes to primary compared to metastatic uh, phase of the disease. Automatically, this will tell you that we, we, we may have a very strong argument that we use the immune checkpoint inhibitors in the earlier phase of the disease rather than the metastatic phase of the disease. And we have seen this actually in the keynote 522 where the uh, uh, pathological complete remission was seen whether your patient is pd one positive or pd one negative, very, very good difference between uh, um, the presence of PEMBRO versus no PEMBRO, whether it is pd one positive or negative. And again, we have seen that the same in the impassion 031. Again, whether your patient is pd one positive or pd one negative, the, the combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors with chemo is doing a very good job. So the final take home message, what we do in the first line setting, that's what we suggested almost one and a half years ago for the first line setting. For, for your 40% population uh, with pd one positive with the SPSA, you give atezole plus napaclitaxel. Now I can add at, at this time, uh, if you do CPS uh, by, by uh, SA, uh, you will find around 38% of your patients, 38% they will be pd one positive, uh, 10 or more by the CPS. You can give again Pembro or chemo. Uh, for the patients with germline mutation or tumor mutation, which uh, tumor BRCA mutation, uh, which uh, will, will, will be something like 50% of, of your patient population. You can give a PARP inhibitor, carboplatin, or carbo plus uh, uh, paclitaxel. If they have both pd one positivity and germline mutation, which will mount to something like uh, 5 to 7.5%, you can give atezo, napaclitaxel, or, or pembro. Although I prefer actually to give the the, uh, the these regimens more than to, to give a, 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 a PARP inhibitors. For otherwise uh, uh, scenarios of uh, biomarkers, which are around 50% of the population, chemo is your standard, whether you give uh, chemo with BEVA or you give a combination, especially the combination of uh, napaclitaxel with carboplatin uh, will go well with your patients. And this is my final take home message and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamdi, for this uh, di good and nice dissection of triple negative breast cancer. I think it's very important to uh, highlight uh, at uh, those who are P the co expression of PDL1 and uh, 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 BRCA mutation. So those yeah. patients who know that BRCA, Olaparib, uh, and the PARP inhibitors uh, usually work in the first line setting while they are less effective in the subsequent line of treatment. And we know the data for immunotherapy. So who's the patient you elect to go for PARP inhibitor rather than immunotherapy? It's, it's a very good question, actually, because when we don't have data, and I, I'm not expecting that we'll have data for in, in, in this particular scenario, at least in the in the shortcomings, my bias is to give first to the immune checkpoint inhibitors with uh, uh, with chemo uh, because actually we lack data of, of efficacy of, of immune checkpoint inhibitors in the second line setting, um, and, and we have seen that we have a narrow escape with chemo plus uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, we have seen that uh, if you if you if you give paclitaxel with atezo, you, you, you don't gain at all, and uh, and for me, I will give I I will prefer to give immune checkpoint inhibitor plus chemo uh, in the first line setting, and I will keep uh, PARP inhibitors. We have seen that the performance of PARP inhibitors, especially in in in, in the data of Embraca, that the performance whether in the first line or second line, they 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 still serve you well. Uh, so I, I, I may prefer to keep them for the second line. It's, it's a personal bias. Um, we don't have anything to support ra except the fact that immune checkpoint inhibitors in the second line setting, they are not doing a, 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 a good job, actually. 
Um, there is a question, and probably this is the last question. Do you have any explanation? And I think you highlighted that uh, Texol versus not Paclitaxel with Atizo, why it's failed. Yeah, it's, 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 it, for me, it was a bad news, actually, be, be, because it, I, I'm in a country where Napaclitaxel is not really available. And we used to give Atizo with Paclitaxel, by the way. Uh, so uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a reason, but, uh, but we have seen similar scenarios in, in, in non-small cell lines, for instance. We have seen in the squamous carcinoma, that uh, uh, patients with with atezo plus uh, carbo and 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 um, and napaclitaxel they were not doing a good job while patients with uh, pembro uh, with napaclitaxel or paclitaxel plus carbo uh, they went fine so maybe it is related to the the synergism posed by each and every immune checkpoint inhibitor with a certain chemo in, in a certain disease, uh, uh, disease, disease pathology. So till we have an explanation, uh, I think we have to, 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 to focus only on the results of the positive studies and we use them in the clinic uh, because it's very difficult to actually to to explain what 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 happened in the study one that you want very 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 difficult to explain thank you very much professor handy we are delighted to have you and thank you for thank you thank you Dr. Hassan. We'll move to the last presentation, and I'm delighted to present uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf Zaydan. He's received his uh, MD and PhD degree in the Medical University of South Carolina in 2009, and he has a radiation oncology from Stanford University. He was appointed as assistant professor in radiation oncology in the University of Miami from 2014 to 2016. He had more than 30 uh, peer review uh, publication, and he had uh, also grants and awards uh, from the uh, uh, um, uh, Radiological Society of North America, as well as American Society of Radiation Oncology. Um, um, we are lucky to have uh, uh, Professor Zidane. His uh, presentation will be radiotherapy in oligometastatic breast cancer, who, when, and how. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of the uh, Multidisciplinary Breast Conference, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'll be covering the radiation therapy perspective on oligometastatic breast cancer. I'm Yusuf Zaydan. I'm a radiation oncologist at the American University of Beirut. I have no disclosures to make. Learning objectives for this session will be reviewing data on SBRT for oligometastatic breast cancer. Uh, I'll be discussing current evidence on local therapy in metastatic breast cancer, and we'll be also discussing uh, currently ongoing trials on the topic. First, starting with good news, survival in metastatic breast cancer is improving, as shown here in this registry from southern Sweden, documenting 411 patients with the grade 3 metastatic breast cancer, where you can clearly see that the uh, uh, two-year survival before 1990 was a dismal below 30%, and in 2010 and after 2010, this survival markedly increased to above 50%. This is uh, due to a large part to, to improvement of our therapies and uh, knowing the biology of breast cancer. And we all see this in practice, particularly with HER2 positive breast cancer, where the survival has been markedly improved with the uh, uh, adoption of HER2 targeted therapies. In clinical practice, we see uh, various kinds of metastatic breast cancer starting on the far left side with the M0 patients and to the far right side with the fully metastatic patients. And we all see patients who are in between. So we all agree that there is a spectrum of metastatic breast cancer patients. Well, Hellman and Waxelbaum recognized this early on in 1995, where they coined the term oligometastasis, oligo coming from the Greek word few. And they issued their famous statement that exists a subset of patients with limited volume metastatic disease who not only have an improved prognosis, but also the treatment of oligometastatic sites could impact survival. 
Since that time, we've been witnessing an increase in the number of reports on ELGO metastatic disease state, uh, starting from 2006 and on. And in particular, I want to highlight the, that most of these studies remain retrospective. However, as we come more recent years, we're seeing more and more prospective evidence phase one, two, and recently phase three trials. In 2020, the number of reports reached 166. Also, another interesting point is that in recent trials enrolling patients for first-line treatment for metastatic breast cancer, 50% of the patients have less than two metastatic sites, and up to 75% of these patients have less than four metastatic sites. So we're seeing increasingly more and more of these oligometastatic breast cancer patients. Now, our colleagues, the surgeons, uh, have probably the earliest experience with local therapy for metastatic breast cancer. On the left-hand side, uh, this is a table summarizing experience with lung metastatomy, where you could see the five-year overall survival rate uh, ranging from 30 to up to 50% in some cases, which is quite encouraging. On the right-hand side, with liver metastatomy, uh, we have five-year overall survival rates reaching up to 60% in some cases. Now, these are quite uh, uh, compelling numbers and encouraging numbers. Of course, these are very well-selected patients, single institution, probably in the hands of the experts in surgery. However, it also speaks to the fact that some of these patients can achieve long-term survival. And indeed, the rationale of, for local therapy in oligometastatic breast cancer keeps it growing, particularly with the improvement of systemic therapies, where systemic therapies these days are well capable of controlling microscopic and distant disease. So it makes sense to use ablative approaches for gross disease sites. It can improve survival, as we have seen in the prior slides, in, in select patients. And of course, treating Oligometastatic disease sites can offer local control in some cases, alleviating uh, symptoms for the patients and prevent seeding of a future new sites. Uh, it, this can in turn result in the quality of life improvement and in some patients resulting in what we call chemo holidays. Another interesting concept with this local therapy and oligometastasis is the evolving concept of immune mediated systemic responses that we are learning with high dose uh, per fraction radio radiotherapy, whereby uh, high dose radiation as shown in the uh, drawing on the right side can release tumor associated antigens. And this in turn could activate dendritic cells, which in turn can prime uh, a specific type of T lymphocytes, CD8 positive T lymphocytes that could help with in situ tumor killing, but also killing uh, tumor cells that are at distant sites as well. As a proof of concept, uh, the Radiotherapy Society had a, a multi-center uh, trial, the Saber Comet a randomized phase two trial that is uh, published now, and this is probably the highest level of evidence that we have at hand. Uh, this trial enrolled patients up to five metastatic lesions. It included patients with different primary tumor sites. The majority were uh, lung, breast, and prostate patients. They were randomized to either standard of care or standard of care plus SBRT. Uh, patients had to have, uh, for eligibility, a primary that is stable for three months or more a maximum of five metastatic lesions and the life expectancy greater than six months. The study has been reported in JC, initially in Lancet and later a more mature result in JCO uh, last year, reporting an improvement in overall survival, 42% uh, at five years for the SBRT arm as compared to 17% for the standard of care arm. Of note, 20%, one-fifth of the patients were breast cancer patients. Most had one to three metastases. So al although they allowed five, however, the majority had up to three metastases. Lung and bone were the most common disease sites, and uh, the majority of patients had metachronous mets, meaning they developed mets 
after the primary was treated before. However, uh, SPRT does not come without a price. One has to keep reminded of the toxicity of SPRT as noted by the Saber Comet uh, trial. Uh, there was an increase in grade two toxicity as shown in the table here, but also uh, an alerting increase in the grade five toxicity, three treatment related deaths were noted in the SPRT arm. And those were, were related to pneumonitis, pulmonary abscess, or a hemorrhage during a surgery to repair a radiation-related injury. So it is not a treatment for everyone, and one has to uh, be very careful in uh, doing uh, the actual SPRT treatment and paying attention to normal tissue injury. Moving forward, uh, and I believe this will be touched on or was touched on in a prior session, we now have evidence for local therapy in de novo stage four breast cancer from multiple uh, trials from different regions of the world, uh, fitting quite nicely with the uh, theme of the conference being international. We have the ECOG 2108 uh, conducted in the States, and we have the Taka Memorial Hospital trial in India, and we have a Turkish MF0701 trial, as well looking at local therapy in de novo stage four breast cancer. Of note, all three trials did not per se require oligometastasis for uh, inclusion. They all included de novo stage four, however, oligometastasis was not uh, a, a criteria for inclusion. So starting with the ECOG 2108 trial, this was reported last year by Dr. Khan uh, in uh, ASTRO meeting. Uh, the trial enrolled patients with stage four breast cancer. They all had to have a, uh, four to eight months of therapy without evidence of disease uh, progression prior to randomization. After systemic therapy, patients were randomized to continuation of systemic therapy or early local therapy. The primary endpoint was, was overall survival, and the primary endpoint was overall survival. There were 256 patients randomized in total, and two-thirds received a radiation therapy after having local surgery. These are the presented results. Uh, there was no difference in overall survival. You could see the curves overlapping on the right-hand side between early local therapy and continued systemic therapy. However, as one would expect, early local therapy did provide around a 15% advantage in local regional control, as shown on the left-hand side. Moving east, the Tata Memorial Randomized Clinical Trial also asked a similar question in de novo metastatic breast cancer. This trial had 350 patients randomized with the primary endpoint being two years overall survival. Patients had to have six cycles of anticycline uh, chemotherapy and they had to have complete or partial response. Then patients were randomized to either local regional treatment or continuation of systemic therapy. The Results are shown to the right side. As you can see, the curves again are completely overlapping. However, one thing to notice is the kind of lower uh, magnitude of overall survival at three years. We're talking around 20% overall survival, which is thought to be to the um, poorer prognosis of the patients enrolled on the trial and also the kind of systemic therapy the patients receive. There were three quarters who had more than three metastases. Visceral mets were seen in 40% of the patients. So literally bone mets were completely excluded. And the minority received modern systemic therapy, meaning and her two targeted therapy and so on, and biological therapy. <clears throat> Still, local regional therapy improved PFS, but not overall uh, survival in this study. Moving to the uh, Turkish study, the MF0701, this trial, unlike the prior two, had a slightly different uh, design, whereby uh, 278 subjects were randomized from the beginning. No systemic therapy was given prior to randomization. Patients were, again, randomized to standard of care, systemic therapy versus local regional therapy. 
And the primary endpoint was the overall survival at three years uh, with a median follow-up of 54 months. There was a statistically significant benefit for early local regional therapy, reaching 41.6% at five years for the uh, treatment group as compared to 24% for the standard therapy group. So literary bone mats were allowed, and in fact, were about one third of the patients, 29%. Most were hormone receptor positive, so 75% were hormone receptor positive. So a little bit more favorable population compared to the Tata Memorial trial. And uh, the improved overall survival seemed to be enriched in these patients with solitary bone mats, 51% as compared to 29%. So with this uh, data in mind, the uh, ESO-ESMO International Consensus Committee for uh, Advanced Breast Cancer issued a statement in 2020 that included patients with uh, allogometastatic breast cancer. The experts agreed that oligometastatic disease is defined as low volume with a limited number and size of metastatic lesions up to five. Uh, and also they, there was a statement that oligometastatic disease of low volume that is highly sensitive can achieve a complete response and remission and a long survival if approached with a multimodality approach with local regional treatment for the curative uh, intent. However, the uh, million dollar question that we all struggle with in clinical practice is whether these patients with oligometastatic breast cancer truly have limited disease or are we just seeing the tip of the iceberg? So we all like to have scenario A, whereby patients with oligometastasis receive systemic therapy and uh, local therapy and achieves a durable response without evidence of disease, or at least uh, uh, durable, uh, locally controlled disease for as long as possible. However, uh, not infrequently, we have scenario B on the right side where patients receive systemic and local therapy and soon after end up with fully metastatic disease. Till today, we do not have uh, uh, great tools to, in order to tell which patient is going to go which route. However, we have some promising biological um, uh, correlates that one could uh, uh, keep an eye on in the future. For example, circulating tumor DNA has an evolving evidence in metastatic breast cancer, as shown here in this JAMA. Uh, meta-analysis for patients with locally advanced breast cancer, clearly those patients that have circulating tumor DNA that is above detectable threshold have a worse disease-free survival. On the right-hand side is another report uh, specifically for patients with a triple negative breast cancer, whereby those with detected positive circulating tumor DNA clearly have a dismal overall uh, prognosis. Another promising biomarker is uh, circulating tumor cells, and this work is led by Dan Hayes from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, where they had a cutoff of five circulating tumor cells per seven and a half uh, milliliters of blood. And here you could see how this cutoff can clearly uh, distinguish those patients that have a durable overall survival and progression-free survival from those that do not have such a good survival. So uh, we do not have enough time to go in detail about this, but there's a huge growing body of evidence on liquid biopsies, CTCs and CTDNA. Those of you who attend ASTRO this year in Chicago wanna put a plug for a session on biological intelligence in oligometastasis. We will have an excellent lineup of speakers, Dan Hayes, from Michigan, we have speakers from WashU joining us and uh, Memorial as well. So uh, hopefully this will be in person, we still don't know. <clears throat> Going forward, uh, we have a randomized clinical trial that is currently accruing the Energy BR002. This trial is accruing uh, specifically oligometastatic breast cancer patients with controlled local regional disease. The study is accruing patients that have four or less oligometastases and have received 12 months or less systemic therapy without evidence of progression. 
the randomization is to total ablation of all metastases, and this could be surgery or FBRT. Uh, and the second arm is uh, standard systemic therapy. The first phase will enroll to achieve a PFS uh, uh, advantage. And if this is met, the study will roll on to, have, to a phase three uh, part to, uh, with an endpoint of OS advantage. Secondary translational endpoints are CTCs and CTDNA as well will be looked at. So this is a, a really neat trial to look at in this disease group. Other than the energy BR002, there are multiple other prospective trials ongoing. I tried in this table to summarize the phase three one. In Europe, we have the Stereosin uh, trial that is also enrolling de novo oligometastatic breast cancer patients. However, they are excluding triple negative subpart from the trial. The randomization, again, is to SPRT versus standard of care with the primary endpoint of PFS. Memorial Small Catering has a, uh, also a randomized trial that is specific for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, but also triple negative breast cancer. Again, looking at a similar question with PFS being the primary endpoint. So a lot of ongoing trials to keep an eye on, and hopefully we will have more answers on which patients benefit from um, local therapy in the future. So in summary, management of oligometastatic breast cancer is multidisciplinary. I think we all agree on that. And these patients are challenging and need to be discussed within the context of a tumor board. Uh, early evidence suggests that overall survival uh, can be uh, uh, beneficial for patients with SBRT in select patients. We can achieve a long, durable overall survival when possible. It is important to enroll such patients on a clinical trial. If you have any open at your institutions, please do enroll. Selection for local therapy should be personalized and the patients need to be involved in the discussions about the risks versus benefits. It's not a treatment without uh, toxicity. These all need to be discussed prior to uh, uh, engaging the patients in local therapies. And we have some really exciting and evolving role for biological biomarkers such as CTCs and CTDNA that hopefully will guide our clinical decisions or at least help guide our clinical decisions in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. It's been great to be part of the conference. It's a conference I look forward to every year and I hope to see everybody in person next year. Till then, stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Zidane, uh, for this nice, uh, comprehensive uh, overview on the subject of oligometastasis. It was uh, very interesting. And I think the statement uh, which can summarize all what you present, that this should be in the context of multidisciplinary approach, especially we lack level one evidence of uh, doing this approach uh, unless it is part of the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll have one question. Uh, in the, uh, the study you present, uh, the Cyber Comet, uh, where, you, where you give uh, radiation to, to, to these uh, uh, from one to five lesions, there was many type of cancer. It is not only breast. So the breast, I think around 20% of that population. And we know colorectal, usually this is the standard approach. So do we know uh, uh, whether the, uh, the, the result of the breast cancer were almost similar to what we see in colorectal cancer or not? A very good question um, that, uh, you know, we definitely as a breast cancer spe specialist, uh, we're all looking forward to a dedicated uh, trial uh, specifically for breast cancer patients. Uh, the Sabre Comet is encouraging, and uh, they had a mixed pool of patients. 20% only were breast cancer. The authors did not perform a subset analysis. I think the numbers are too low to, uh, to do a subset analysis. However, the um, Energy BR002 trial is specifically dedicated for uh, breast cancer uh, patients, and their criteria is a slightly different. They, um, they allow up to four uh, metastatic uh, lesions. So the results from that trial will be uh, very important in order to specifically tell for breast cancer patients whether 
going with local therapy. Until we have the results from the energy BR002, uh, we have to use our best judgment and use the expert consensus, for example, from the ESMO, the ABC guidelines that we have at hand. Uh, it is reasonable to recommend such a treatment for the right patients that prove to have well-controlled disease over a durable amount of time. Uh, so personally, in my practice, uh, I like to see a durable amount of disease control and lack of progression prior in, uh, to going in with local therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, we hope to, to see you next year uh, in our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Uh, I apologize uh, for being late. I think we are 15 minutes late, so I will hand over to uh, Dr. Bashir.